very glad to introduce uh, James Roberts. Uh, James is a researcher in uh, systemics. Uh, he contributes to projects related to uh, communication networks. Um, he was a former member of uh, INRIA from 2009 to 2013. And uh, after spending more than uh, 30 years in uh, France Telecom Labs, um, he received his uh, first degree in mathematics in the University of Surrey and, and uh, his uh, PhD from uh, Paris 6 in computer science. And his uh, uh, research is in the area of uh, 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 dimensioning and performance of uh, networks. He has uh, published more than uh, 100 papers and is uh, uh, a great researcher. So uh, I'm very pleased to 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 give him the the floor for his uh, for his talk today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Paul, uh, and thank you for coming. And I. Hope my friends from System X don't mind me speaking to them in English. We've usually been speaking in French, but I decided to give this talk in English. It's my mother la language. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the internet, about the internet, the network, not the applications which you might see Google and all the web applications, but rather about the infrastructure which underlies this phenomenon that, that is the internet. And I'm going to talk about engineering the internet. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain the title, just the, the, this notion of trade-off between bandwidth and memory will become clear in the talk. It's just one object of engineering for the internet, and it's an example which I hope will explain to you who don't know probably too much about the internet and, and, and networking uh, exactly what we do in the project, a System X project called ARE uh, for, for network architecture. Um, I had a button. So engineering the internet. The internet is a network. It's a network of networks. Uh, the, the drawing depicts a network and the cloud in the background is not the cloud of cloud computing. It's the cloud which represents the rest of the network. So you, you're, you're typically connected to a network like the network of Orange and Orange will be connected to all the other networks in the world. Uh, the network is just a set of routers and links typically and uh, we'd be interested in knowing how to dimension these links and how to manage the sharing of those links between different types of traffic in order to respect some kind of quality of service. So this is a, this is a role of, of a traffic engine. I've called it a traffic engine. This is the term, uh, the title I had when I started work a long, long time ago, more than 40 years ago. And, and the, the network at that time was the telephone network. And we had the job of uh, dimension the network, and in the first place, understanding uh, this engineering relationship, this relationship between demand, performance, and capacity, which underlies, I, I, I would like to say, all engineering work. It might be building a bridge. You'd like to know that the bridge will stay up, uh, given its capacity and reinforced concrete and whatever else, under the demand which you expect. For a network context, uh, demand is the flow of packets in the internet. It's the, it's the result of all the clicks you do on your, on, your, on your PC which send data through the network. So it's a stochastic process of, uh, of entities which need to be carried through this network. And because it's a stochastic process, you can't typically dimension to the worst case as you'd like to do maybe with a bridge. You wouldn't like a bridge to fall down if the wind happened to be a bit higher than it was usually. But in the network context, losing a packet or having a telephone call blocked is not a catastrophe and typically you dimension the network so that the quality of service, the performance is good enough. And good enough depends on, on the particular service, but you'd like to trade off uh, degradation of performance against the cost of providing more capacity to avoid those degradations. So understanding this relationship, uh, the, it, I think this has been turned, no, it's working, okay. <laughs> the the uh, understanding this relationship was something I learned when I started to work, which was fundamental to the telephone network. It turns out that the internet is not being designed by engineers mainly, it's been designed by computer scientists 
and, and this relationship is often neglected, much to my regret. But this talk is not about traffic engineering in general, it's talking about traffic engineering, a issue, an issue in the traffic engineering in a future internet, and the future internet will be information-centric. And I'm going to explain about that. So this is the outline of the talk in four parts. The first one I'm going to talk about this process of engineering an information-centric network. What is an information-centric network? And the other chapters I'm not going to explain now because the, the titles are a little bit obscure and they become clear, I hope, as the talk proceeds. So the first case is about engineering an information-centric network. So what does that mean? The network I draw initially is uh, not complete in that we didn't have any source of data. And, and typically in the internet now, the internet is used majority, large majority, more than 90% of the internet traffic is dealing with content retrieval. You're getting web pages, you're getting files, you're getting more and more videos. And these videos may be coming from across the network. Let me see if this, is there a button? Yes. So this, this represents some data center maybe of Google somewhere across the network. And, and, and whenever you do a click on, on, on a Google uh, service, maybe a YouTube, then that's going to trigger a download of a document, lots of sequence of packets which are going to go through the network and generate traffic which needs to be carried. So you need to be able to dimension the links, dimension the, the routers, which are the blue dots and the yellow dots, in order that you can carry that traffic. So the, 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 the obvious... Uh, thing to do in, in this case as, as the network becomes more and more content oriented is to include memories within the path of these data flows, within the routers typically. So if you put, uh, uh, this cylinder represents some memory, a memory cache, and if when you download a YouTube video, you keep a copy of that in one of these caches, then uh, the next time someone's going to ask for that YouTube, they're going to find it without going all the way up to the Google server here. And therefore, they're going to economize all this traffic. And if you put caches lower down, you economize traffic there. And maybe if you wanted to put large caches at the edge, you'd economize a lot of bandwidth in, in the network. Bandwidth including the routing equipment represented by the blue dots. Um, there is obviously a trade-off. Uh, you might like to put more memory in these, these cylinders. This might be bigger, and that would catch more traffic because you'd be able to store more content close to the users. But that would cost a lot of money, typically. I mean, it would cost uh, more as you put in more cash. But then you'd save more bandwidth because you'd need to carry less and less uh, flows of packets within the network. So there's a trade-off between these two things. And this is quite critical in engineering the network. We'd like to be able to... Uh, choose the optimal size of caches and place them in an optimal manner. There's uh, two ways we can proceed in adapting the internet to this content paradigm. We can continue to evolve the internet. We can make uh, enhancements, adaptations, which make the internet more efficient by putting memories in the, in, in the routers or beside the routers, or we can uh, imagine uh, a completely new architecture. So this is the, the, the notion of information-centric networking. Uh, this term has been invented not just as a, a, a common description of what the internet has become, but for a new architecture which will replace the current architecture. Uh, so let me give you the background on this work on a, a new internet architecture. The internet architecture which is currently used, which you use every day, is IP. It's called Internet Protocol. It's not very clever, but it was designed uh, some 40 years ago, 1970s, 80s, uh, for uh, scientists, computer scientists, to communicate. Um, they made some brilliant design decisions. One of these connectionless packet switching originated, at least to, to many people, in France and in Rio at Cyclade with Louis Poussin. The end-to-end -end principle is uh, the idea that the internet, the blue dots, the links, should be as simple as possible, that any complicated operations should be done at the edge, beyond the network, within the host, within the computers. And that, that's been quite a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of people would say that this network designed 40 years ago 
uh, incorporated some design decisions which weren't ideal. But the fact that the internet was growing right from the start and it became more and more important, it became increasingly difficult to change these design decisions. And these are kind of related to the naming structure, the routing. Uh, and however, the, the internet, as we know, has been growing from success to success. It's been able to absorb growth. And, 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 and people would say that this is perhaps more to Moore's law than necessarily that all the design decisions were excellent. Um, the internet was not designed for present needs, it's obvious. It was designed for messaging, email, primitive email, and file transfers, sharing printers, things like this. And now, of course, it's used for content, it's used for the web, used for file transfers, used more and more for video transfers. And the evolution in usage has, has thrown up problems which didn't exist in the initial, in the initial internet because the, the, the environment was quite different. So the problems of security in the first place, problems of performance. The, the internet generally works very well, but sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it's not, no guarantees for performance. Mobility, when, when we're now using telephones, mobile smartphones uh, as terminals, and we're wandering about, then it's necessary to manage this mobility. And, and it's possible in the internet, but it's quite complicated and, and prone to error. Uh, the network is hard to engineer. It's been built up. There's been lots of things added and, and things added to compensate for errors which have been introduced and whatever. It's become very complex. Uh, and lastly, the, the business model of the internet is, 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 I call it improvised. It means it's not very satisfactory. There's a conflict which is occurring continually and, and, and comes to the surface quite frequently between content providers like Google and Netflix who transmit lots and lots of data or customers retrieve lots and lots of data from these providers over the operator's network without paying uh, a, just, uh, a just fee, a just uh, tariff for that service. So that th this is because the business model was never conceived, never designed uh, with, with this type of application in mind. So, uh, like 10 years ago, uh, some of the researchers in the internet world, mainly in the US, got together and said, well, we, 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 perhaps we should start again. Perhaps we should uh, put IP to one side and think what would be an ideal architecture. And this has been known as the clean slate approach. So you wipe your slate clean and you start again. Uh, and at this time, 2005, the National Science Foundation in the US, that's the funding agency, started to finance projects. The European Union followed suit, and in Asia also there was a lot of activity in this area. And there are lots of propositions financed in these projects, which I won't try to summarize. Uh, the, 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 a couple I, I, I just intended to highlight, network virtualization, virtualization of computer memory and things like that, was been uh, very successful. Uh, and it was supposed that maybe the network could be virtualized in order that different architectures, different types of network could coexist on the same infrastructure. So we have different virtual networks on the same infrastructure. And then the last one is, is what we're going to talk about. It's this, a network designed for content retrieval, not a network which is designed for file transfer, but rather which, which was designed with the, with the current applications in mind. Uh, of this effort, considerable effort, uh, I could say that two major trends have emerged, two, two major trends have survived, if we can say. Uh, the, 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 the end of the financing from the, from the project agencies. The first is known as software-defined networking. I'm not going to talk about that. It's, it's a very important aspect which is currently being implemented and researched also. Uh, it's not clean slate because it's, it's been able to implement, being implemented over IP, over the current internet. And the second one is information-centric networking. So that's the subject of the, of the talk. Uh, information-centric networking might be conceived as an, as an enhancement to IP. It might be able to m make IP evolve to be more information-centric. But th there's also this uh, clean slate approach, and I'm going to talk to you now about one proposition for a clean slate uh, information-centric network and it's called NDN for named data networking. Uh, so NDN was initially proposed by someone called Van Jacobsen. It's uh, someone you, if you don't know 
uh, anything about networking. You don't know who he is, but he's very uh, well known in the networking area. And, and, and the fact that he proposed this has, has caused quite a lot of interest and a lot of people have followed his, his, his propositions, which are quite intelligent. Uh, so he introduced this as content-centric networking. Uh, it was named name data networking to differentiate it from, from the product he initially proposed uh, in uh, an NSF project. So it's an NSF project which was financed for three years. It's been renewed for another three years. It's got quite a, a, a large consortium of universities and a bit of industry in, in the US. So the the, the uh, radical change, uh, I think the most radical change in this new architecture is that the packets are no longer datagrams as envisaged by Louis Poussin, where a datagram is a packet with an address on and you send it into the network like a letter in the post and the address allows you to route it to the destination you want. The idea here is that instead of sending packets to destinations, you write the name of the content you want on the packet and you send it in the network. And the network does what's necessary to return that content to you. So you don't ask directly for a, for a movie, but you'd ask for a chunk of the movie. These are typically four kilobytes, there might be 10 kilobytes, that's not decided, but it's something quite small, packet-sized. And every packet like this, every chunk has a name, which is unique, and you ask for this uh, chunk using what they call an interest packet. You write the name in a packet, a little packet, send it into the network, and the network will send it, the data corresponding to this name back to you using a data packet. Uh, and of course, as, as, as we're interested in caching, it's interesting to remember that the, the, ca the chunks will be stored in, in, in caches within routers along the path. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten I did this animation. So this is an interest packet going into the network, finds the data here, it's returned to the user. The, 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 the data is stored in the caches so that if a new user requests the same content, he doesn't have to go all the way up the network to fetch it. So that's what I already mentioned. Uh, the NDN uh, architecture is based on routers, NDN routers, and NDN routers consist of computers with three tables, three important tables, which I'm highlighting here. First is the 4D information base. A FIB exists already in IP routers, and a FIB in an IP router will tell you which output to send a packet based on its address. And the FIB in a name data network will just do the same thing based on the name which you write in the packet. Then there's a, what we call a pending interest table. A pending interest table lists all the interest packets, the, the, the origins of the interest packets which have been received, uh, which have been sent out to fetch the data, but the data has not come back yet. So it's pending. That means it's waiting for a response. And the content stores the cache where you store the data. So the procedure is that when you send an interest uh, on, say, an input here, the interest will first, or the, 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 the router will first check the content store to see if the data corresponding to this interest with the name is present already. If it's present already, it's going to send it back straight away and not do anything else. If it's not present, then the uh, router will check the PIT, the pending interest table. Because if there's already been a demand for this particular name chunk, then it's not necessary to re-demand another, another copy of the same one. You just add the name of the input to the list in the table so that when the data comes back, it's going to get sent to the new, in, new input as well as the old input. And if it's not in the pit, then you want to put it in the pit because you want to look in the FIB, the forwarding information base, to find the output to which you should send it. So you send it on the output, you put the memory of this, this demand in the pit, and then you wait for the data to come back. When the data comes back, usually it does, the data will come back, you check in the pit from whom, who, who asked for this data. If there's one, you send this data back. If there's several, you duplicate the data and send it to all the people who asked for it. And at the same time, uh, you typically store the data in, in the content store for future demands. Okay, so that's the way it works. It's quite neat, uh, it's uh, not so different from regular routers. Uh, a great advantage of this 
function, this, this operation, is that you save bandwidth. So, so from my point of view as a traffic engineer, I'm interested in economizing bandwidth. So the first one is, 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 is this notion that you, 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 you store data in the content store for deferred multicasting. So whenever someone asks for this data, not too long after a, a previous request, you typically find the content in the content store and you can send it without going to fetch it from Google or anywhere else a long way away in the network. And the second one is, is, is the, the notion of multicasting, of live video, simultaneous multicasting. The fact that when you send an interest uh, and a previous interest is still in the pit, this will be typical of a multicast, a live multicast. Everyone's watching the same. They're all sending interests for the same video at this more or less the same time. In this case, then, then the, the, this operation with a pit, with adding, adding interfaces on the pit table, realizes multicasting. So that, that, that's quite an advantage. There are other advantages. Uh, uh, the first one is saving bandwidth. The second one is that it facilitates mobility management, at least of the requester, because the request can ask, send interests from wherever he is. You can send interests from here, you can send interests from your office, you can send interests while you're walking, and, and, and then the network will know where it's, you sent them from and send you back the data to the right place. Uh, it's also very good for network security. I, I mean, it's not been proved that this is going to stop phishing, all the viruses and whatever, but at least what you can do is that you can encrypt the data chunks. And you can encrypt the data chunks with a degree of encryption, a degree of confidentiality, which is matched with the data in question. So if it's just a regular thing which no security involved, maybe you won't encrypt it at all. But if it's some very vital information about your bank account or whatever, then you want to encrypt it very tightly. So this is a nice shift in, 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 in the focus of network security from the network equipment to the data itself. And the network equipment can be much more relaxed about security. On the other hand, um, these advantages are not convinced everyone that we, we actually need to switch to this new network. People note that caching exists already. Uh, you, you, you may not be aware of it, but if you request things from Google, often it doesn't come from Google server, it will come from what we call a content distribution network, which will be, which will be servers attached to the network much closer to where you are. And these are known as con content distribution networks. Uh, Name-based forwarding uh, is nice in principle, but it, it brings scalability issues. That means that the number of names you need to remember in the FIB can be huge. And, 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 and you, you, you might typically not be able to uh, provide logic, electronic logic, which works fast enough to, 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 to create a table which is big enough. So that, that there are some answers to this, hierarchical naming, things like this, but th these are still research issues. And of course, the, 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 the fact that internet works still pretty well, and we're all finding new things to do with internet every day, means that no one's in a real hurry to change, that there's no panic, we don't need to change. And an and ICN maybe has not got a killer application. That means something new, which would be really great, let's do this. It's, it's more of a, a, a qualitative uh, change, maybe it's cheaper, maybe at long, in long run it's cheaper to use this information-centric net, information networking, but in order to make the first step you need something more compelling, more exciting. So it's a, it's a debate. One of the elements in the debate is cost-effectiveness, and cost-effectiveness depends on this uh, traffic engineering issue. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. So that's uh, modeling the performance of these caches. So uh, this is the, the idea. We, 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 we're interested in this relationship between demand capacity and performance, this relationship which is common to all engineering activity, I pretend, uh, which is relevant to this problem. So we want to uh, typically size a cache C in order that the, uh, the hit rate, this is the, perf the performance measure, is sufficiently high. Uh, the hit rate is the proportion of requests which come from users which will be satisfied by the cache. So you get a hit if you find the object in the cache. And if you get a miss, then you've got to go 
into the network and find it somewhere else, and that's going to cost you some, 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 some investment in, in capacity. Um, the capacity is not just the size in, in, in bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, but it's also the way you deal with the, the content. You can, when the cache is full and you retrieve a new object here, then you'd like to store it in the cache for future demands. If the cache is full, you've got to kick someone else out, kick some other content out. So the way you choose that content to, to, to be displaced is also part of the capacity. Uh, the demand is, is, is a process of requests, which is going to come from a population of users. This cache will be located at some point within the network, one of those blue or yellow dots, which will receive demands from a, a population of users. And these, the, 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 the population of users will generate demands, uh, and you'd like to describe the way they do that. First of all, what, 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 what's the nature of these demands? I think it's important to, 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 to remember. I, I said 90% earlier, and it's, I looked more recently, and it's 96% of the internet traffic is content of some form or another. And 60% now uh, of this 96% is video. Video of one form or another. It might be YouTube's, it might be Netflix now. It's certainly been Netflix for a long time in the US, like 30% of the traffic is Netflix in the US. In France, we've had it for a couple of weeks, so there's not so much yet. Uh, live video is, is, is something which is growing, uh, and, and webcams and things like this, but these are quite marginal for the moment. Um, if you add up all the content corresponding to these different categories, you get huge numbers. So if, if, you, if you recognize that the number of web pages out there now is like 10 to the 11, each web page might be uh, on average a few hundred, a hundred kilobytes or something. If you do the product, which I, I, I've not done directly, you get something around a petabyte. So it's 10 to the 15 bytes. That's uh, like... Uh, a million gigabytes, it's a lot. Uh, and if you do the same thing for peer-to-peer -peer traffic, if you look at the torrents on BitTorrent, that's the peer-to-peer the -peer service, uh, you can count up the, 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 the number of bytes represented by these torrents, and that also comes to something like a petabyte. And similarly, YouTube's user-generated content in, in the Google sense, there again, I did some rough calculations, they're very rough, and I got a petabyte. The only hope might be uh, in video on demand where Netflix catalog is, is measured in thousands of movies and series uh, and, and the total uh, is probably more than a terabyte but it's something like that. Let's say an order of a terabyte, it's a different order of magnitude, it's a thousand less and that might be significant. Uh, the demand for these different elements is, is of course highly skewed. There are some very, very popular items, some very high scoring YouTubes and, and lots of YouTubes. The YouTube you, you, you made of your, your, your kid playing uh, will never be asked by anyone except your family. So that's very, very low demand. So there's very skewed demand. The skewed demand is in fact characterized quite nicely statistically by what's called Zipf law. So Zipf was a, 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 an American researcher who, who, who counted the occurrence of words in, 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 in English language. And the most popular word in English is the. The second most popular is of. And I think the third most popular is to. And what he found was that the, 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 first, the, the second most popular was half as popular as the first one. And that the third most popular was a third as popular as the first one. And that continued for all the words in the book he was actually analyzing. So this gave a, a kind of power law of the popularity. What we find in more different applications, in particular in the content retrieval applications, is that we have a zip behavior, a power law behavior, but that the parameter is not one, as in zip's original law, but is, is, is different. And, and, and typically, the, 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 the parameter is, is, is somewhat less than one, about 80%. So the zip law is represented here. This gives the popularity in terms of the request rate, or something proportional to the request rate, as a function of the rank. So the, the, the one is the most popular object. This is the, the billionth least popular object. Uh, and its popularity is like uh, a lot less than the other one, like a billionth less than the other one. 
Um, so that, that's a kind of a, 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 what's observed uh, in practice is more like the, the curve I'm drawing here. This, this is a curve I obtained looking at BitTorrent uh, trackers. I didn't actually look at it, I got it from someone else who looked at them. But you, on, on, a, on a tracker you can see the number of cedars, the number of leeches for every torrent and this is the number at time t at, the, at a particular instant. And these people have scraped lots of trackers and they've recorded the number of leeches and the number of leeches is, is, is like proportional to the number of people who are requesting chunks of the, of the, of the torrent. So it gives a measure of this popularity. So this, this is what I obtained when I, when I analyzed that data. And, and you find that the, uh, the, 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 the start of the popularity distribution is, is somewhat flatter than the body, and the, and the tail tails off very quickly. Uh, what's interesting is that even though the tail is very unpopular, compared to the most popular, the fact that there are a vast number of objects in this part means that the, the traffic generated is still very significant, like 30% here. So that's this kind of statistical picture of the, of the popularity distribution. If we want to model the, the, the request process, then there's a, a technique which was introduced uh, in the 70s for looking at caches in computer systems, and this is, this is called the independent reference model. The independent reference model says that every demand for an object is drawn from a distribution Q of n, proportional to Q of n, in fact, uh, and this independent of, of, of whatever requests have been made previously. So it's a kind of a stationary process. It's something which every object, you, change, you pick an object from the same distribution. So this is a, this is a quite convenient uh, uh, model. It allows you to model the occupancy of caches uh, mathematically and to deduce certain uh, statistics, which I'm going to show you later. First of all, notice that this uh, assumption ignores what we call time locality. The fact that a, a, a piece of content, a YouTube video, is popular for a certain time, but not forever. And it, certainly its popularity relative to other ones changes over time. This is ignored in the independent reference model, which is mathematically very convenient and can be justified for, sh for fairly short periods if the, if the evolution of popularity is over a longer time scale than the period in which you're interested in. However, it, it, it is complicated. And in particular, it's difficult, in fact, to estimate this distribution Q of n by any measurements. Because typically, uh, this is what people do. I mean, they make measurements in the network of requests for particular types of content over a period of time. They class the content according to the popularity, and they say, well, this is the popularity distribution. Problem is that in order to get reliable statistics, they've got to measure over a long period. In that long period, the popularity has changed quite a lot. So you get a, 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 an almost impossible compromise between the accuracy and the, uh, and, the, and the accuracy, statistical accuracy, and, and the actual accuracy of the, of the measurements, which are in fact changing. So this is, this is something we battle with. We've not really got a good solution to it yet, I don't think. Uh, the, the, the thing about the torrent distribution is that that doesn't suffer from time locality because you scrape the trackers all at the same time, virtually at the same time. So there's not this popularity variability. However, the trackers are global. Uh, you've got on the tracker Chinese content as well as American, as well as French. And, uh, and, and you're looking at the popularity of these contents worldwide, which is not going to be very relevant in your network, which is in the, in, in, in the Paliso area around here, for example. So that, that's a second disadvantage. We're still uh, uh, looking really for, for a very good characterization of the popularity beyond that. However, next thing we want to talk about is the replacement policy. When, when uh, a cache is full, the cache is typically full, and a new request arrives, you want to cache this new request, new object uh, within the cache, you've got to reject another one. So you can do this by uh, typically rejecting the object which was least recently requested. This is probably not very popular, so if we kick it out, it's not too bad. Uh, you might want to do it more easily just picking one at random. 
Uh, an ideal way would be if you were able to measure the frequency with which they're used to reject the one which is least frequently used. In fact, uh, uh, most work, um, in fact, there's been a lot of research actually comparing these different things. Uh, I, I tend to think that the least recently used is a, is a good compromise between accuracy and simplicity. It's not difficult to implement. You've got a linked list uh, of objects within the cache, most recent at the left and least recent at the right. If you get a request for the blue object, it becomes most recent and shifts the others down. If you get a request for a yellow object which wasn't in the cache, it goes to the front and kicks the least, least recent one out. So that's fairly easy to realize, uh, I think. Now I, I, I'm coming to a, to, 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 to a slide which is not, you're not going to understand because I'm going to go through it very quickly, but I just wanted to include it because it's uh, like indicative of the kind of models we use. It's a very neat model for calculating the hit rate for a given uh, request process and assuming the independent reference model. So this was proposed by these authors, Che uh, and a couple of other authors from the US, they're actually Chinese from the US, and they were working on this for the web caches at the time. And they suppose that there's a, a characteristic time TC, which is the time to receive C different objects, uh, which means that C different objects between uh, the initial time and a time TC later means you will have kicked out every object which was there at TC because you've had 20, you, 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 you've had the C uh, different objects coming in that time. But TC is, is a random variable. And the, the idea of these authors was that we'd forget about it being random, varying, and we assume it's a constant, unknown constant. And if it's an unknown constant, the fact that the independent reference model can be modeled by Poisson requests means that you can calculate the hit rate, which is the probability that the interval between two requests is greater than this characteristic time. And that's given by this exponential function. And then you notice that C, uh, the cache, is always full. So it's a sum of indicator functions. The indicator functions is one when object I or object N is in the cache. So that, that's an identity. And then if you take expectations of that identity, C is a constant the expectation of an indicator function is its probability, the probability of the event, which happens to be the hit rate. Well, it's one, yes, it's the hit rate. So we have this equation here, C equals something in TC, that we can solve numerically for TC. And given that we've got TC, we can calculate the hit rates N. So that, that's, that's pretty neat. It was introduced as an heuristic. And uh, we made a contribution with colleagues in INRIA uh, Christine Fricke and Philippe Robert, and we, we were able to prove that this is, uh, this is very simplistic as a description, but in fact turns out to be very accurate. So that's, uh, you know, it's just a flash to let you know we don't just, we do maths in, in, in this, this work. We, we do maths which involves probabilities and queuing theory. Uh, given that method, we can evaluate the hit rate and, and, and understand how it behaves as a function of parameters. In particular, the parameter alpha of the zip law is very significant. And as I said, we, we typically find that alpha is around 0.8. If we mistakenly suppose that it was greater than 1, 1.2, then we'd be particularly optimistic about the hit rate. For a, a cache equal to one tenth. Of the, uh, of, of the catalog, so we, we, we know 100, 1% 1 of the catalog. With, with this zip floor, we got about 60% hit rate, which is very big. In reality, we would only have something like 10%, and we'd need a much bigger cache in order to get a respectable hit rate. The value of the catalog is very significant. Here we've got plotting the, the, the cache size is a normalized variable. And what we find is that, that there's, that tends to a limit, the, the hit rate as a function of the cache size, the normal cache size tends to a limit as n increases. On the other hand, if we had supposed that alpha was greater than 1, the fact that we've got a series which, which converges this time, then this means that the actual n has a different impact. I mean, if we plotted these curves against c and not c over n, these two curves would be very close together. 
But that, that's just uh, probably not very important to insist on. So I get to the, to the last chapter, which is actually evaluating the bandwidth, memory bandwidth trade-off. Um, let me talk, tell you, first of all, this, this, is, this is quite a, a hot topic at the moment, exactly where we should put the caches and how big should the caches be. Um, a lot of people have been doing research assuming that you've got a network, the network is given, might be the network of France or somewhere else, with its capacities, with its topology, and that you've got a cache budget, you've got a certain volume of memory that you're going to use in that network to optimal effect. You want to know where you should put that cache, how you should distribute it, say between the edge here and between the core, the, 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 the center of the network. Um, People have done this research, a lot of people have observed that if the cache budget is big enough, then it turns out that the strategy of simply caching at the edge, forget about caches here and just cache here at the edge, is not much more expensive than the optimum. Obviously the optimum is going to put a bit of cache here and there and everywhere. Uh, and actually the optimum will tend to, 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 to push the cache down the network as the cache budget increases. Well, an objection I have to this was that the cache budget is not uh, a given. It's not something which you play with. I mean, we were talking about designing a future network. We don't have a cache budget. We don't have a network. We've got to design the network from scratch. We've got to engineer it. We've got to decide where we should put the caches uh, and how much bandwidth we can save. It's not a question of having bandwidth already there. Uh, that just doesn't exist. So, uh, for example, yeah, this is an example, if, if, if memory is very, very cheap, it's almost free, then we, we, we'd all have a cache at home with all the content of the world. And we wouldn't need a, re a, a network except to fill that with new content, which would which obviously be silly, but it's just an illustration that uh, this cache, cache budget idea isn't a very sound one, in my point, opinion. So I, 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 I try to calculate this in a, in, in a more simple context, this notion of trade-off. So we have the idea of a simple symmetric network where uh, we have S sites, these are the yellow-orange dots, and uh, we have up the top of the network all the content. And uh, I've just represented it by a, 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 a single cylinder which contains all the content in the world. And uh, each site requests a certain amount of traffic, generating a traffic in bits per second. This is the way we, we measure the demand. And this is the traffic in the busiest period of the day. And it's this traffic which will be used for dimensioning the network, because typically you want to carry all this traffic with a, a, a negligible degradation. And, and the T here is, is the total traffic, it's the sum of all these red arrows. We put a cache of capacity C at each of these nodes. This is entirely symmetric. And uh, we calculate the total traffic to be carried by the network as this function. It's T multiplied by M of C. And M of C is just the, the complement of the hit rate. It's the miss rate. It's the proportion of requests which have to go up to this top level to be served and, and therefore have to be carried through this network here. Uh, given that, we can estimate very simplistically and, and approximately the cost of caching. The cost of caching is the size of the cache multiplied by the number of caches, S's, so SC, and I've introduced a unit memory cost. So K of M is the cost per unit of, of memory, say per gigabyte. And, and the cost of bandwidth is, is, is the traffic you've got to carry times the cost of carrying that traffic, which again, assuming, I assume is linear. So we've got a unit cost per bandwidth. This is very simplistic. I, I don't pretend it's very uh, rocket science by any means. However, it, in it, to give a handle on the, on the question of this memory bandwidth trade-off. Uh, the data we can use uh, the first for the popularity of the distribution Q, which will determine the miss rate M, uh, I, I'm assuming that distribution I measured with bit torrent, so it's uh, an empirical distribution. The N for that data set was 
like uh, 1.6 petabytes. I'm assuming there's one terabyte, tera, terabit per second of traffic, which is typical of what's in France, France Telecom's network. It might be several terabytes or something like that, but I, I've just taken one terabyte. And 100 is like the number of sites you'd have in France which are on the edge of the network. Again, these are not by any means accurate figures. Uh, less accurate still, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm destroying my own work here, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's the best I could do. So the, the, the cost of memory is, is not too inaccurate because we've got cost Amazon sells memory per month, and, and, and that's my five cents per gigabyte. Well, I put 15 because maybe I can be a bit more pessimistic. Um, Measuring the, the cost of bandwidth is more difficult. There are no publicly available figures. And even if I talk to people in Orange, my ex-colleagues, they can't give me a figure. They don't actually know. They've got databases full of cost data, but they're actually converting to that to a cost per month, per megabit per second. It's really very dif difficult. I did find some data on the web, and I did get some advice from colleagues in, in Orange. And I came up with this figure, 15 euros per megabit per second per month. It's not unrealistic. Given that, I can calculate the cost. So I can calculate the cost, and I'm plotting the cost on this log linear scale. Uh, the x-axis is the cache size in bytes. This is the maximum, and this is zero. And this is the cost of this, this, this simplified cost formula. And on the left, when C is zero, this is equal to the maximum cost of bandwidth. So it's, if you didn't have any caches, you'd have to dimension your network to carry all that traffic T. Uh, and on the, on the right, that's if you put a cache which is capable of stocking everything. You don't need any, any, any uh, bandwidth, but you do need to pay for all this cache. And there's an optimum. There's an optimum here. So it turns out to, to be uh, about half the, the cost of the maximum cost of bandwidth. And, and the optimal size uh, corresponds to a hit rate of about 70%. That's a, that's a very insignificant result in that it's just a point in space and I chose those data fairly uh, approximately. If, if I'd made a mistake on, 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 the, on the evaluation of the cost of bandwidth by a factor of 10, I would get these curves. And this is perhaps more typical. The, the, the notion here, I've got a cost of bandwidth which was 10 times more expensive than I initially thought. In this case, typically I do need a big cash. If, on the other hand, I'd made a mistake and the cost of bandwidth was 10 times more than it actually is, then I wouldn't do any caching. So typically, we've got this situation where you've got uh, all or nothing. Uh, if, 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 if the cost ratio is such that you're on this blue curve, put in a big cache. And I've got some figures here for the hit rate. Typically, you, you, you'd want to put in a cache which is very close to the, the, the catalog size. And you get a hit rate which is more than 95%. If, on the other hand, you, you've got a parameter down here, then don't do any caching or, or very little caching. It's hardly worth it. So there's a lesson I draw is, is not from this particular example, but you can extract this parameter. This parameter is the ratio of the maximum bandwidth cost to the maximum storage cost. So it was the ratio of this uh, point to this point. And uh, depending on the value of gamma, you can say that if gamma turns out to be very big, here, cache almost everything. You, you, uh, if gamma turns out to be very small, don't cache anything. And the gamma depends on the, on the size, the number of sites, the size of the catalog, and the traffic. So you can, for different situations, use this perhaps to get some handle on, on whether you should be caching at the edge or not. Uh, and typically, uh, if now we had that curve in the middle, which was not very conclusive, I, I observed that the cost of memory is decreasing. It's decreasing very rapidly over years and years at 40% per annum. And the cost of bandwidth is also decreasing. It's less easy to get a measure, but I, 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 I guessed that it was about 20% per year, in which case the, the gamma is increasing and it will increase tenfold in less than four years. So even if we're now at a, at a marginal area in 10 years, we would typically be in the, in the blue curve and would therefore 
it was very interesting to cache uh, at the edge uh, and save bandwidth. The edge uh, in my drawing was clear, it was the, it was the orange dots. In, in reality, the edge goes right down to your, your terminal. And in the, 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 there are points within the edge where you might want to put caches still. And this is still an active area of research. It's very interesting, in particular in the mobile access network, to know whether you want to put caches at base stations, at caches at some intermediate points, or caches just at the point where you join the internet, which is typically much higher in the network. Um, I came to the conclusion that the, these caches would typically, to be cost effective, would be very big and typically bigger than you could reasonably include as a content store in that NDN router I, 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 I outlined to you earlier. It's an, an, the, the, the content store you need to be able to access very quickly, check up what's in it and do that in the time that a packet arrives and before it leaves, and which is very, very close, very tight. Uh, I think that if you, if you want to put terabytes, tens of terabytes rather, tens or hundreds of terabytes, which is what the conclusion of, of this numerical study was, then that's not feasible. And, and you typically want to put caches in, in something off path, uh, like you do actually now. You've got servers which are uh, associated with a router, but which are not part of the router. And in, in particular, uh, it's extrapolating quite a long way, but it might be that the router, rather than including a content store, would more likely a data center, which includes storage as well as compute, would be the router itself. And the routing function would be one application which runs in the data center as well as others all the others which are in the cloud now and uh, which are growing. And uh, in particular, the, the, the storage of content would no longer be really an optimization issue because it's not so expensive uh, to, 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 to add extra storage as necessary. Uh, as I said, there's still scope for this access part. This, the access I drew here is, it, it, it isn't like this. It's, it, it's much more complicated than this. There's lots of branches and lots of trees and whatever. And, and actually where you want to put the cache is, is a very interesting and important issue. So conclusions are more of a recap. First of all, this traffic engine in the, inter in the internet. System X is about systems engineering. Our system is the network. And we're dealing with engineering that network, especially for the realizing this traffic engineering function relating demand capacity and performance. Uh, caching is a new dimension in that, in, in that, in that area. I mean, so it makes it interesting. Uh, the internet is certainly information centric, whether it will be a new architecture or not. It's still information centric and we need to take account of that. Um, cache performance is critical and, and, I, and I did want to illustrate the kind of model we develop it's based on queuing theory, probabilistic reasoning. And this Che is Che Hua, it's not Che Guevara. He, he told us how to do that. Uh, the optimal structure depends on this memory bandwidth trade-off. And I, I do insist on that. And, and, and I do recognize that the model I presented to you is very rudimentary. I really would like other people to take it up. Obviously not you, but people who work in the networking. It's not something which is uh, currently on the agenda uh, uh, of most people. So that completes the talk. So thank you for your attention. If you've got any questions, we can go on. <laughs> Luca, do you want to put the record straight? <laughs> yeah. Lionel Escama from Systemics. Thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Maybe one quick question. Did you uh, try to draw parallel with other industries, namely logistics, where inventory is like cash? And I'm thinking about Amazon, who tries to keep the most frequently purchased items to where they are really bought, so that when you order a piece of equipment, you get it within one or two days. OK, no, I didn't. No, it's a good, good point. I'd certainly look into that, yeah. <laughs> you heard of that, Luca? <laughs> if you don't know, Luca, Luca is there, is, is, is in charge of the IRE project, so he's uh, very much aware of all this 
information-centric networking. We, we, we work on this project, in, not, not, in, not in Palace, so, but in, in, in Paris at the Lynx Lab, so it's, that's why you don't see us <laughs> in the coffee machine. Yeah. Hi, thank you, James. Well, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Uh, okay, I'm an engineer at uh, uh, ERDC in the mix. Um, I have a question about the cache. You know, I have worked several years on processor cache. You know, from, uh, 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 you know, in the last uh, past uh, 30 years, we have more than uh, 30 different uh, processor cache architecture. Mm -hmm. So uh, I even participate a uh, project to compare the performance of the different caches. You know, uh, the cache you speak here is not the process cache, I, if I understand well. It's, it's most like some local memory. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, it's, a, it's a cache to store content so that you need, don't need to go right the way up to the data center where it came from initially. So it's, it's a memory, yes, it's a memory. It's, a, it's not like the process of cache, okay. although the techniques we're talking about them, I, I, I mentioned this Che approximation. Other people in the past have, have, have done other evaluations. Typically, the evaluation of a process of caches have a small scale. Uh, the, the, the scale of terabytes, petabytes doesn't occur in that, in that environment, and therefore you can have accurate, exact, exact solutions of the cache performance problem. Uh, which you can evaluate numerically. It's when, when you get into this scale problem that you need an, an approximation. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, 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 wh what happens when uh, the data at the source is uh, removed or uh, uh, updated? Uh, you uh, mean it, uh, because the cache, uh, the cache code, yeah, that's, that's an issue. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know? I mean, there, 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 there's, a, there's a question of authentication of data, and typically it can be signed, and maybe if, if there's a new version, then the, the signature will be adjusted uh, as a consequence. I mean, they, these are issues, but they're not issues I'm very clever about. And as I said, I'm doing this traffic engineering stuff. You've got cached copies of, of, of a document, and, and suddenly it's changed. Actually, yeah. In so a, in, in NDN, you have a field which is uh, was a part of a, a name component in the name name structure, and one is is a version. So basically, you, if the cache has a, um, the, the latest version for the same content, can reply with one of those versions. So you can have different replies depending on what you have available. So you may choose between. Uh, uh, maybe low latency because maybe the old version is close to you, or maybe fresh information, uh, but maybe requiring more latency because it's uh, in, the, in the server. So you you can't you have this kind of scheduling decisions you you may you may uh, implement in the network uh, in every single node. Thank you, Jim. Uh, quick question about the hit ratio. You mentioned, uh, as an example, 0 0.7 as being uh, optimum for these uh, figures. That particular case, but the others were, uh, depending on the parameters, it might. It was more like near 1 or 0. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder how, how difficult it is to reach a uh, significant number uh, such as uh, 0 0.7 for... for uh, caching is it, does it imply to have a, a huge uh, memory cache or well that's what we were trying to evaluate yeah exactly I mean it, the, the the conclusion was that you should provide sufficient cache to get a very big hit rate if if the cost ratio is is, is high that gamma function and and, and that don't, don't don't we have a few uh, a few figures uh, coming from uh, from the, the live box or coming from the, the, the boxes at home that, that give us a hint about uh, uh, how much uh, heat ratio we can uh, reach simply by uh, uh, caching the, the, the last 10 content uh, received or that's a different issue it's not not I mean this is with the independent reference model and the independent reference model assuming a fixed population. And it's uh, you know it's typically coming from a, 
a, a, a large demand base, not just one user. Single users, I mean, Luca and, and colleagues have, have made measurements on the performance of caching in live boxes and found quite a high ratio. That means that uh, user behavior is such that people copy, re, re, retrieve the same content repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So you, you imagine someone looking at a, the latest uh, Justin Bieber video and they don't just look at it once they look at it repeatedly until there's a new something or somebody else so i mean that that's a different phenomenon we're talking about statistical phenomena here uh, it's a, it, it, i didn't i didn't want to give you the impression that this is this is this is a, a solved problem it's still a a problem which is which is a topic of active research we had a conference last week in paris on icn on information centric networking and there were like Five papers on caching, at least, maybe more, and, and, and there's still still a lot of lot of work to be done and opinions to be formed. And, yeah. Great talk, uh, thank you, G. Uh, I have just one question about the in your model you defined the popularity of your data. So can you give some data about how how it's defined? The popularity is the relative request rate. I mean, for, for the torrents, it's, the, it's proportional to the number of leeches. You know torrent, how it works? With leeches, the people are downloading the, the, the thing at any instant. So they're requesting chunks at random, and then therefore you can estimate the arrival rate of requests for different chunks. So it's that, that's the popularity, and then you kind of normalize that to get a probability if you want to. But it's just... Uh, a relative measure, like uh, some torrent with a huge number of leeches because it's the latest latest uh, episode of Game of Thrones, uh, whereas there might be another torrent which is a, uh, some Chinese lessons for German students, <laughs> and then maybe have one leecher if ever. Uh, wouldn't it be uh, easier to use um, content-centric internet if uh, there was a different economic model for uh, internet ac actors? It might be a, a motivation to introduce the internet because the, the, the economic model is not satisfactory at the moment. The, 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 the idea about the information-centric network, as, as I see it, would be that the, the operator, the one who provides the bandwidth and the routers, would also provide the, the caching infrastructure. So, so, so he would sell uh, its capacity to store and to deliver data uh, as, a, as a combined service. At the moment, the economic model is such that the, the operator can cache some data, but not very much, and that there are other actors, they're called content delivery networks, who actually install servers at strategic points and, and have a deal with the content providers like Netflix or like a different Le Monde or, or uh, other content providers in order that they will deliver them at the points of the network. So that's uh, the problem with changing an economic ecosystem is that there's typically needs to be a very strong incentive for a first mover in order to things to change. And that's something which is indeed a, a problem at the moment. Yeah. Okay, thank you.